so, curious, how many of you, um, don't be ashamed by this, by the way, how many of you are over the age of uh, 60? Can I just see your hands? Look, that's it. Everybody look around. Hold them up. Be proud. Can we celebrate our, our 60s? Yeah, good. How, how many of you are under the age of uh, 25? Under the age of 25? Look at that. Look at that. Can we celebrate them? Everybody else really doesn't matter at this point. I'm just kidding. I fall in that category too. Um, so if you're over the age of 60, how many of you have ever made this comment? Uh, well, well let, me, let, me, let me back up. So I go to see my dad. He, he's 83, and um, he has a lot of health issues. Um, he doesn't walk really well. That's why he's not here a lot. It's one of the um, reasons. And so, but he always says this every single time I go see him, which is like at least twice a week. Chris, I don't know what's happening to this world. And then he'll just talk bad about, you can probably imagine what. Whether that is leadership, whether that is uh, overseas wars, whether that's the economy, um, the shootings that happen. Like, so my dad just goes, and I don't necessarily, I'm not worried about you, I'm worried about my granddaughter. What kind of world she's going to grow up in. And I try to remind him, I say, Dad, I'm sure that your father and your grandfather said the same thing about you. Right? You can think back. You, uh, uh, where is this world going? What's wrong with this world? Today? I don't know what's wrong with people today. You ever thought that? What's wrong with this world? What's wrong with people? That's the title of today's sermon. What's wrong? Why are you so jacked up? What's wrong with people today? Why is this world so messed up? I'm, I'm going to show you from God's word why this world is so jacked up. And, and look, don't, don't, I don't want to be a Debbie Downer, but don't get under the impression that the world 10 years from now is going to be so much better. It don't matter who's in the, in the White House. It, it doesn't matter. Look, look, listen to me. Satan has dominion over this world right now and is allowed by God the Father, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This world can only, it is only going to look so good to followers of Jesus. What's wrong with people today? How many of you have people in your life, if they're sitting with you, I wouldn't advise raising their hand. But how many people have people in their life and they're like, I don't know what's wrong with my uncle. I don't know what's wrong with, they're crazy. This world is jacked up, right? My boss, right? I, don't raise your hand too fast on that one, right? So... What's wrong with people? I, I, I was serving at Serve Saturday yesterday. By the way, thank you for those who served. I think we had over 30-some, close to 40 people serving um, throughout Raleigh. It was awesome, and um, we do that periodically. But I was serving with the guy who was leading it. His name Paul. And Paul was like, did you know that Raleigh, Raleigh is the number 14 city in all of America? For the fastest growing number of murders. Charlotte is number 15. Durham is 26. You a little shocked by that? In fact, in Raleigh, you know where most of the murders are happening? Don't say downtown. Mm -hmm. East Raleigh, close to Nightdale. Near us. I don't know about you, but we're called to be a light to a dark world, and it seems like our community is kind of dark. What's wrong with people today? We're in the book of Ephesians. We're in chapter 4 today. We're going through it. If you've missed any of them, uh, go back on our YouTube channel. Go on our app. You can watch all these sermons um, totally free. Our resource from us to you, but Ephesians 4, Paul is writing from prison. He's not in a great place in a situation physically. He's writing to the church in Ephesus, modern day LA, cool climates, port city, thriving, but a worldly secular city. And there's a church there now who knows Jesus. And Paul says this in Ephesians 4, verse 17. Now, this I say and testify in the Lord that you must 
no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Remember we talked about what Gentile, who Gentiles are, right? You have Jewish people and then you have everybody else. In this context too, Paul's saying, listen, don't walk like the people who don't know God. That's who Gentiles are. Every follower of Jesus, not just if you heard and know, but every follower of Jesus is not a Gentile, technically speaking. Gentiles now are people who don't know God. So how do they live? Paul says, don't walk like people who are unsaved. He's talking to the church, and he says, because they walk in the futility of their minds. This is how people with Jesus are, y'all. It's their minds. It's their world. It's their family. It's their business. It's their success. It's their money. It's their time. It is all about how I perceive truth. Let me just tell you something. The world today is pushing an agenda, is pushing truth on people, what they call truth. And so now we don't even know what is real. Let's just be honest. Some of you think you know. We don't have a clue what's real. And Paul says, don't walk like unbelievers because they're selfish. They reject God. Paul says this in Romans 1. Just listen to this. I don't know if it'll be on the screens or not, but, but just listen to this. Romans 1, chapter, uh, verse 21. Although people know God, they didn't honor him. Give thanks to him. They became futile, there's that word again, in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. So here's what God did. Listen, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who's blessed forever. For this reason, now they knew about God, but they weren't honoring God. They weren't living right. They were not blessing God. They were not worshiping God. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Listen to this. Women exchange natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, i.e., women started to have relationships, relations, doing married stuff that's meant for men, and women, women started doing stuff with women. And the men, they gave up on natural relations with women. They were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. Now listen. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They're gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Where my parents at? Shout out, right? Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. I just described 2022. This was written long ago. Long before describing, describing a people who knew about God but were living like he didn't exist. And God gave them up to everything they thought was good. Everything people thought would please them and help them and make them better. This is today, isn't it? People don't even know if they're a boy or a girl. You think God was confused when he created you? Transgender, homosexuality, this is what this just described. God has given people up to doing this. He's, he says, this way of thinking, listen to me, this way of thinking is futile. You, you might not know what that word means. This way of thinking is empty, worthless, void, meaningless, 
useless. If you want to live a life that is worthless, useless, pointless, you won't have any peace, you'll be scared all the time, you'll have anxiety, you'll be confused about truth, you, you won't, if you want to live that kind of life, then do what you want. Think the way you want. You be God. Paul says that's futile, that's worthless. Remember now, Paul's talking to the church. So I'm talking to you. Are you living this way? He goes on and says, verse 18, they're darkened in their understanding. They're blind to God. That's what that means. They can't see him anywhere. We look out in the world today. Can we see God? People without Christ are blind. They're alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them. Y'all, just newsflash. You got a God-sized hole in your heart. Every, every person has this craving, this need, this desire for something. And that something is God. And what happens is we try and fill it with everything else. We fill it with pleasure. We fill it with more. We fill it with success. We fill it with worry. We fill it with relationships, sleeping with people after people. We're filling it with social media, more followers, more accolades, more stuff, right? But the bottom line is, it is a God-sized hole in your heart that can only be filled by God. And, and so, the problem is, the problem is, Gentiles, unbelievers, lost people don't even know it's God that they're missing. You see how hard that is? They can't see. They cannot see God. You can do whatever you want to scream at them. You can tell them they got to get in church. You can tell them to obey rules. But they don't even know it's God that they need. It's God that they're missing. They can't see his glory, his beauty, his majesty. Why? Due to the hardness of God heart that's what paul says in other words you hear the truth you'll see, some of you today you'll hear the truth and you'll reject it because your heart's hard and what's supposed to soften you what's supposed to melt your heart of stone actually is just hardening it and do you know why your heart becomes harder and harder Listen, this is, this is a message for some of you. The more you pursue sin and self and stuff, the harder your heart becomes. And what happens is when sin is ignored, your conscience becomes silenced. And what should Melt your heart. Doesn't. We're kind of a PG-13 church here. Just going to tell you. But when you think all you're doing is following a social media account that posts some provocative pictures or some questionable stuff, you know what you're really doing? You're desensitizing your heart to sin. Listen to me, parents, and I'm guilty of this. When you allow your children to listen or watch stuff that is pouring into their minds and changing the way they think, and now they are receiving this as truth, you know what we're doing to our children? We're desensitizing them to sin. When you start looking at pornography, this was my story, 13, 13, the age of my daughter. I got introduced to pornography. They now say that second and third graders are getting introduced to it. And what started out as a picture grew to wanting magazines. Grew, this was before social media, y'all, so I'm a little old, I get it grew to videos computer was just starting so then now I could try and go upstairs and hide it from my mom and dad 
And what was happening, and I didn't even know it, was my brain was being programmed differently. And so for a period of time, listen, this is real stuff. For a period of time, I saw women as porn stars. And some of you men, you're living a life of sin. Some of you women, you read you read these provocative novels. Don't you think that's not changing your mind? Don't you think that's not hardening your heart to sin to the point now where you don't even think about it? You just go out and buy what you want. And I'm not, it doesn't have to be with bad stuff. You know this, right? This could be good stuff too. You just pursue it and pursue it. And you want, to, you want the best business. You, you want the most money. You, 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 and, and we just do this and we lose sight of sin. Verse 19, Paul says, these people have become callous. Anybody got a callous today? When you get, when you, I remember I used to write all the time. Write. I don't even know if they write in school anymore. They might just type. But we wrote with pencils all day. They didn't have these nice pads for your fingers. And so when I was in ISS a lot or detention, and I would write, I will not talk in class. I will not talk in class. I will, I'm talking like 500 times, y'all. And, and now that's abuse. I get it. But listen, so I'm writing and, and like, and, it, and you develop this callus on your finger. What is a callus? A callus actually means I don't feel it anymore when I play guitar. Guitarists know this. When you play guitar, you develop calluses on your fingertips so you can push down as hard as you want. When you first start, it hurts. It's like sin. Paul says, don't you church, don't you be like the world because they become callous, verse 19. They've given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And listen to me. We all have greedy lusts inside of us. All of us. Identity. Identity is a big struggle today. Some of you have to have a relationship to be fulfilled. It's an identity problem. You don't feel loved unless you're being told or being around people. You don't feel like you're worth anything unless you have fill in the blank. It's greedy lust. And what happens is over time, you think you have to have that thing to survive. We get addicted. And I hate it because we, when I say addicts, you think drugs and alcohol. There's so much more that we get addicted to, isn't it? Laziness, gluttony, greed. This is us. We, church, we cannot be like the world. And look, what happens is when we, we keep trying to fix ourselves, we keep trying, and what we do is say, well, I got to go to church. I got to get back in church. Some of you are getting back into church because you think church is what you're missing. And so what you do without even saying this or maybe even realizes it is you use God. You want to hear this? So you come to God to get what you think you need. And you're not even coming to God, you're coming to church. You're coming to church to feel better. You're coming to church for maybe an answer, but you're coming, it's religion. It's religion. This is what Jesus preached against all the time, religion. He was, he was, he's not about religious people. Some people give to God, right? But why? Because God will bless them. And so they give and they're scared not to give because if they don't give, God will take away. You believe in God, so you'll go to heaven, but it's all about you. You obey God, so you don't get in trouble. Some of us are walking on tiptoes all the time, afraid that if I say something wrong or if I sin, I better run to the altar because God's about to strike my family down with health. And, and when we get in a crisis, when somebody's on their deathbed, when a family member's sick, when we lose our job, when our marriage is on the rocks, we run to God to fix it. We ain't talked to God in years, but we run to him when we need him. 
because we're selfish. But God doesn't, God just doesn't want to fix you or your situation. God, listen to me, some of you need to hear this. God wants you exactly like you are. Broken, jacked up sinners. He wants you. He wants all of you, the hidden parts. And Paul is telling the church, stop living like the lost. Stop. Some of you need to get off of social media now. Because you can't, you can't help but post things just to irritate people. Get off social media. I'm just telling you. You think that's godly? None of you would say that's godly. It just feels good to get that off my chest. We got to stop posting like the world. We got to stop being afraid like the world. We have a king, y'all. His name is Jesus. If he conquered death, he can take care of everything else. That's the whole point. So why in the world are you displaying to a lost world how scared you are? What are you truly afraid of? What is it that you're holding on to that you won't let go to God and let Him hold it? We can't be like the world. We've got to be holy. Holy. Now, when I say that, I don't like it because I know how unholy my brain is. I know how unholy my mouth can be. I know how unholy the people sometimes that I'm around are. How in the world can I be holy, Chris? Paul's telling the church, be holy. I'm telling you, be holy. How? Next verse. Verse 20. That is not the way you learned Christ. Underline that word learned. That is not the way you learned Christ. That word means to come to know. He goes on and says, assuming that you have heard about him, underline that, and were taught him, underline that, the truth is in Jesus. Can I be real honest with you? Jesus is not some Bible story, some fairy tale God that you've heard about your whole life. Jesus is a real person. He is the son of God who lived and is still living. He died and rose again so that you might have life. Eternal salvation. Jesus is alive. He is a real person today. And you must learn Christ. Now, how do you learn things? I just, this is not a trick question. How do you learn? Well, some of you are like me, and you've got to fail to learn. <laughs> you've got you to keep making stupid choices in order to learn. What's Paul talking about? we got to learn Jesus. I've heard about Jesus. It's not just hearing Jesus. See, you know, you know when your kids tell you that I've heard, I hear you, Dad. I hear you, Mom. You've said it before, right? But they're not hearing you. They're not listening. They hear a sound. They know the words, but they are not applying it. Paul says, you've got to learn Christ. In other words, salvation it starts in your heart, but it goes through your mind. You want to know how you know you're saved? Because you think differently. You think differently. You think differently. Now, how do I think differently? Romans 12 says, renew your minds. How do we renew our minds? We renew our minds by the word of God. If you don't enjoy the word of God, then you don't enjoy God. And I don't mean that you have to love reading. I don't, I'm just telling you, if you don't enjoy being in the presence of God, with the people of God, under the word of God, with the preaching of God, like, you need a heart check. This is God's word. And, and you'll go around and you know you're struggling and you have issues and you've got all this stuff. And the answer is in the book, is in his word, is with his people through prayer. And we have to learn Christ. Why? Why is this so important? My thinking has to change. Listen, this is, this is key. Because what you believe determines how you behave. Don't tell me you trust Christ. And then you're, you're sitting here worried to death about everything. 
Your life is characterized and known because you live in a constant state of anxiety, fear, and worry. You can't trust in something if you won't be willing to let go. What you believe determines how you behave. Churches, at least how I remember and grew up, and it's no fault of anyone's, it was just the church was so about doing right. Don't do this. That's all I remember really. Don't do this. Don't do this. Don't do this. And all those things that you shouldn't do, maybe that was right. Maybe those teachings were right. In fact, looking back, they were. But the problem is I grew up with this mindset that being a Christian is all about what I can't do and what I can do. But I didn't really, I wasn't having my mind renewed. I wasn't thinking on these things. Because once I believe differently, I will behave differently. And that's what happens here in Paul, verse 22, when he says, put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life, is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. There it is. Put on the new self. Some of you have gotten saved, and you, t- <laughs> uh, some of you got saved, and you took off your old way of living, but you never put on anything new. You're, you're a naked Christian out there. And, and look, you, 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 I, mean, I don't mean that ugly, but like you took off the dirty clothes, but you forgot to put on the new clothes. And now what's happened is it's five years later, ten years later, and you remember how it used to be. And so you grab that dirty sock and you slide it back on. And eventually over time, you've grabbed this old outfit that's not you, and now you're trying to be new in an old way, and it doesn't work. Paul says, take that old stuff off, but don't just take it off. Put something new on. Clothe yourself in Christ. Get in the Word. Get in God's house. Praise and worship. Get under the preaching and teaching. Be in community together. Man, I, I was talking. I was ta- you, you may have seen this. I'm coming on down. Sorry. So I was talking with uh, somebody, a couple of people actually, and their, their, spouse, their spouses don't get involved in the church, don't come regularly, don't serve regularly, don't, and they do. And I was like, what is it? What is it? And they said, I, I don't even know. Could be church hurt, could be they think it's boring. They, just don't, they don't want to, they're sleeping, it's not important, whatever the reason is, right? And I said, I said this, I said, they, and, and, and people say, well, they just think that you don't have to be, a say, you don't have to be okay with God and be a part of a church. Fair enough. My response was, my response was, that's right. And you can be married and your husband or wife stay away for a long time, how successful is that marriage? Is your marriage thriving if your husband won't come home? Is your marriage thriving if your wife is always at work and only comes home to sleep? So how in the world can your relationship with God, with Christ, who literally calls the church his bride. How can it be thriving? How can you be growing? How can you be knowing God more if you skip out on his body? It doesn't work. You can be saved. But what kind of light are you putting out to a lost world? Paul says, take off that old way. You got new habits. You got new disciplines, new priorities. You think differently, you do things differently. Following Jesus is not just about coming to church and obeying rules. Following Jesus is about saturating yourself in the gospel. You, you want to know how to change today? Somebody, I talked to somebody the other day, said, I've I just been this way for 30 years. Well, you're saved. You're not supposed to be that way. I've just been this way. It's what I know. 
Of course it is. That's your old self. Go ahead and take it off, throw it away, burn it, and put on Christ. Put on Christ, you know. Put him on. Gospel change is a response to grace. Not an attempt to earn God's favor. And I I believe so many people are trying to earn their way to please God. And God's like, no, you can't do nothing to earn your way to me. I'm pleased with you because of my son. Like, you don't even have to do anything. Nothing. Do you get this? You want to be okay with God? Some of you are not at peace today. You want to be okay with God? Accept his son as your controller, Lord. Some of you are so afraid, and that's why you obey. Uh, Can you imagine if I told Lily, Lily, don't you lie. If you lie, you go to hell. And I'll take your iPhone for a year. She'd be more scared of the iPhone, right? Now, what did I just do? I put fear into Lily. And she might obey. Problem is, she doesn't learn to love the truth. She's just not lying. Or if I say, Lily, don't lie. You're better than that. You're a prat. We don't lie. We're honest. Uphold my name well. And so I can motivate her to tell the truth. Now she might not lie because she thinks she's better than everybody. Problem is, she doesn't love the truth. We do this all the time. Do better to get to God or God will strike you down. So God is proud of you. So God won't hurt you. You know what that's called? Moralism. Moralism. And this is what the church promoted for a long time. Don't go, don't go watch rated R movies. Don't get drunk. Don't drink. Don't smoke. Don't chew. Don't hang with people who do. You know, all that kind of stuff, right? And this stuff might be right. And this stuff may be honorable. But the problem is... We started obeying not because we loved truth and loved God, but because we feared what would happen. Parents, behavior modification will not change a person's heart. We should have it. There should be consequences. But gospel change, true gospel change is a response to the grace that you have been given. I love it when Lily obeys me because she wants to. Not because she has to or is afraid to. Gospel change starts with the heart. You got a right heart, you got right actions. So if you're struggling with doing right, check your heart. Verse 25, Paul goes into now how the church should treat one another. You ready? I want you to think of one another. If you don't know one another... That's the first issue. we got to get to know one another. And Paul says, when you got the right heart, watch what happens. You put away falsehood, verse 25. Speak the truth with his neighbor. We tell the truth here. If you're in sin, I'm going to call you out in love. Because it's true. Because I want to restore fellowship with me and you. You got a problem with somebody? Go fix it. Go seek them out. Tell the truth. In order to speak the truth, you got to know the word because the word is truth. You speak the truth. When it's a hard situation, you're backed in a corner. Don't you tell a lie to get ahead. Don't you tell a lie to get out. Speak truth to one another, church. He goes on, verse 26, be angry. Do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Did you see this? Paul actually commands you to be angry. Hey, being angry is not a sin. Jesus flipping over the tables. Righteous anger. What was he angry at? He was angry at the sin. We got little Nova Hopkins. Cancer. Three. Right? We talked about her last week. She's done nothing. Nothing. But she has this cancer. And that makes me angry. Not at her. But what is killing her body? Right? Don't you get angry at that? What's killing her body? It's not right, is it? 
in the same way, in the same way, if I love you spiritually, I will hate the sin that is destroying your soul. Righteous anger. It's selfless anger. Paul says, don't be selfish and angry. This happens in marriage a lot, I think. I'm, a, I'm guessing. See what I did there? You should have loving anger. Paul says, don't let the sun go down. What's Paul saying? When your anger is selfish, your anger will simmer. You know what I mean? You want to know how anger is selfless? Get rid of it quick. Forgive quickly. Because if you let it simmer, it starts to fester and ooze and you become bitter. If you can't let your anger go, it's because you're selfish. Because it hurt you. I get it. Paul's saying, get rid of it. Fix it. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Young people, and I'm talking to you specifically, young people, because I'm younger, but I'm not older, too much older. But here's what I want to tell you, young people. Work hard. Work hard in school. Work hard in life. Work hard in your relationships with your parents. Work hard. You want to know why they're clapping? Because we have raised, now I'm talking to me and parents, we are raising a generation that is lazy. They are lazy physically. They are lazy mentally. And what we have done is raised lazy kids who are spiritually lazy. They'd rather sit at home on their phones, doing nothing, getting fed whatever's going in their brains, getting fed physical. They don't want to work hard. They don't want to sweat. They don't want to put in effort. They don't want anything to hurt them. Paul says, you better work, and you better work hard. Why? He says, so that you can share and meet needs. I mean, is this a crazy concept? What if you worked? What if all the work you do and the money you get, and the wisdom that you get, and the time that you have was not about you. What if you just decided individually or as a family, I'm going to help people in need. And, and I'm going to start with, with my church. That's who Paul's talking to. That's community. That's what we want. That's what we're lacking. And notice, we're not going to be thieves. Listen to me, mom and dad. Some of us go to work and we're on social media or we're just lazy. We're not working hard. We do what we want and we're cheating our boss. We're cheating our company and we're robbing them of the time. They don't get back. Don't cheat on your taxes because that's easy to do. This is Paul. We meet needs. We work hard to help those who need it. We're burden bearers. I'm not going to push this too much. But I just wonder how many of us rob God with our finances, with our time. We say, I just don't have time. We've sat around watching football for Six hours, I didn't have time to read my Bible. I didn't have time to go meet a need. Some of us have never, never worshipped God by being generous. We, we don't tithe because we don't think we have enough, so we're saying, God, you haven't given me enough. We don't, we don't give because we're afraid. We don't trust. We think these bills are going to come and there's no way I can do it because mathematically it doesn't work out. And God has commanded and talked to us over and over in his word about giving first, giving best, and yet we hold on the things that we think are most important. We're robbing. We're thieves. Paul says don't do this. That's why tithing is just a starting point, just so you know this. And I don't talk a lot about tithing. I, 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 maybe I should. But if you're struggling to be generous to God, His church, 
that's a great starting point. When you get paid, when I get paid, the first thing I do, that's the first thing. That's not pay my bills and then. He gets first. He gets best. Because I want to remind myself that my God is first in my life. He's not sloppy seconds. Paul goes on, he says, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Corrupt talk comes from a corrupt heart. Don't you blame your cursing, your language, your, your slander, your gossip, your backbiting, your unkind words, your inappropriate jokes. Don't, bra- don't blame your job or the way you grew up. You are new in Christ. That's your old way. Take off those dirty clothes and start renewing your mind by getting in the Word. If you've got a language problem, you've got a heart problem. Get in the Word so it let it transform. Pray to God. Ask Him to take that away. Stop listening to things. Stop seeing things that are going to corrupt your mind. Learn Christ. Some of you need to stop being so critical. Stop being complaining so much. Only speak what builds up. Try that. Tomorrow, just one day. Maybe No, no, no. Just the rest of this day. Only speak and say things that will build up people. Just try it today. When you go out to lunch, when you go out to lunch, don't be talking about anything in a negative way. Hold that in. Let the Holy Spirit handle that. Because you know why if you don't? Can I, can I share something with you? It's sad. If you're known by a cheat, if you're living your old life and, cl- and claiming Christ, if you can't get your language under control, if people know you're, you say you're a Christian, but they're kind of wondering, well, n- not different, do you know what you've done? Look at the next verse. Verse 30. Paul says, don't grieve. The Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Do you know how to grieve the Holy Spirit? It's by not taking off the old and replacing with the new. This is not a salvation issue. This is a right mind issue because a right mind will determine how you behave. And if you keep living the old life, if you keep hanging with the same jerks, the same guys who aren't saved, if you keep going to the same places you've always been, if you keep following on social media the same people that the world follows, if you keep getting pleasure the same way the world does, you gossip. You are grieving the Holy Spirit of God, listen, who sealed you. You want to know why we're powerless today, church? Because we got too many Christians that are grieving the Holy Spirit. And here's the truth. Here's the truth. Paul ends this way. I just want to show you this. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor and slander be put away from you. Take all that away. Notice, that's all about other people. Take it all away. And then the next verse is how we can... Live this out. Verse 32. Be kind to one another. (laughs) Tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Seems to be a theme these days, doesn't it? How do we forgive? As God in Christ forgave you. He forgave you completely, fully, always. Stop focusing on self. Start seeing others. You want to know what's wrong with people today? You want to know what's wrong with the world today? I can tell you. It's not a president. It's not the economy. It's not the school system. It's not the people in charge. Do you want to know the biggest problem with this world today? What's wrong with the world today is that Christians, Christians are loving God with their lips but denying Him with their life. You want to know why the dark world has no hope? Doesn't see a way out. It's because our lights are not shining brightly. We're living 
like the world. We're thinking like the world. We're spending our money the way. We date the world the, the, the way the world dates. We talk. I mean, it's ridiculous. And we expect a lost world to be found by Christ. We're hiding our, this little light of mine, we're hiding it. Well, I can't do it, Chris. I just struggle with this. I've struggled 40 years. I've struggled 30 years. I just think different way. What? I, how do I? I don't have, I'm not strong enough. Can I tell you? You are, you are strong enough because you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. And where you are weak, he is strong. You have the power through the Holy Spirit. You have the power through the word. You don't lack power. Do you know what you lack? You lack obedience. If you don't obey God, can I, can I just be real? This is a strong word. If you don't obey God, you better check if you really love God. I'm just telling you. That's not my words. Let's just take God's words on this. John chapter 14. Read it on your own this week. Listen to these verses. If you love me, this is Jesus. If you love me, keep my commands. Seven verses later in, chap in verse 21. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. I want to close this way because I want you to see this. We're not singing at the end, but I want you to see this. Some of us say that we love God. Oh, I love God. And we're saved, right? And I'm not, that's great. Praise God. But then you go out. Listen to me, teenager. I'm going to speak to you, teenager. You go out and you date the way you want to. And you objectify women or men. And you're looking for a feel-good moment, a feel-good pleasure. And some of you have crossed boundaries and you're doing married things and you're not even close to marriage. And we know that we know that's designed for marriage, created by God for marriage, intimacy created for marriage. And some of you, and I'm not just talking to teenagers, some of you, some of you just can't keep it, your pants up. And so you say this, I know what God wants, I'm a Christian, but I don't really care what the Bible says about that. And we rip it up. Or we say, hey, obviously, obviously, we're going to see this next week, but obviously I shouldn't get drunk. That's a sin to get drunk. Some of you got plastered this weekend, or you go to sporting events, and you get wasted, or you struggle with alcohol, and you know what God has said, and there's no doubt you would say, yeah, I know, but I just struggle. And so what you do is you say, when you, when you start that, down that road, when you go to the place where you know alcohol is going to be, and you struggle with it, and then you take your first sip, and then you got no control, and you go, I know I shouldn't get drunk, I know what God thinks, but I'm just going to do it anyway. This is God's word. This is his instructions. I know I shouldn't talk about other people. But it just ticked me off. It just ticked me off. It's over and over. Don't gossip. Don't gossip. Don't backbite. Every, everything that comes out of your mouth should be edifying. Some of you are offended. Because I ripped pages. It's not even God's word, just so you know. But some of you were offended right then. But you will go out here and live your life and offend God any way you want to. You don't lack power today. Church, you got all the power you need. You lack obedience. So today, make a mark. Get, and by the way, <laughs> I'm just going to say this. Some of you have tried this before, tried to let go, tried to stop, tried to start, and it fails. You want to know why? 
It's not because you're not trying. It's not because you don't believe. It's because you're not being held accountable. You want me to hold you accountable? I will. You ask people in my life group, in my D group, you ask people that, I will bother you. I'm just, I will call you out, right? right I will call you out, Jake, right to your face. I had to speak hard stuff to Jake. And then afterwards, I'm like, do you hate me? Every time, he's like, I need it. Get with people who will hold you accountable. By the way, it doesn't need to be your wife or your husband. I'm just telling you, that's easy. Some of you become so comfortable with your wife and husband that you can lie to them, and your heart, heart is hardened and desensitized. Go ahead. Share with somebody in the church that you respect, who you love, who you value. You got a problem with sin? You don't lack the power. Go ahead. That Holy Spirit's waiting. Ask him, but then be obedient. Okay? Yeah? Everybody okay with that word? Yeah, come on. Let's praise God for that word today. Hey, church, listen, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray, and um, we're going to get out of here. No, no music today. I'm going to pray, but I want you to leave. I want to leave differently. I want to search my heart. What greedy lust do I have? I want to lay it down before God. I want to be held accountable. I want to get in a group. Some of you need to get in a group. Some of you take your next steps. Now let's go out here and be a light in a dark world. Father, thank you so much for your word, for your truth, for conviction, God. I know that people right now are struggling with sin. I know it. And I know you have given us all that we need. We, we, we are begging for answers, God, but you have given us the helper, the advocate. Now you just want us to obey from that right heart. I pray for it today. As you keep praying, real quick, how many of you would say, nobody look around, just keep praying. How many of you would say, Chris, I'm really struggling with sin. My, even, even my family doesn't know about it. I, I've never confessed it, maybe even to God. And, and I, I, I recognize that there's some sin in my life and I've been disobedient for so long, I need accountability, I need help, but in the best way I can, I'm going to lay that down at the cross. I'm going to let Jesus have that, and I'm going to turn from that sin, and I'm going to pursue Christ, I'm going to pursue His Word, I'm going to be connected in the church, but I need prayer, I need accountability. Would you pray for me? If that's you, struggling with sin, struggling with obedience, just lift your hand, I just want to pray for you, not to embarrass you. I see you, yeah, all over, go ahead. Yeah, a yeah, amen. Amen, church. That's so good. Father, thank you for confession and repentance and obedience, God. I pray for next steps, God. It doesn't stop here. It's just the beginning. I pray these people get connected with you, would confess with you, would talk to others who would hold them accountable, God. As you continue to pray, thank you so much for your honesty. I do believe there might be some people who've never given their life to Christ here today. Like you've just... You understand the stories, but you're not walking in truth. You really haven't learned Christ. You just heard about Him. Today, I want to I let you know that no matter where you've been, no matter where you are, right now, you can experience freedom. Not only freedom from your sin, but freedom from separation of God, from God. See, Jesus, God's son, was sent to this earth because I'm a sinner and because you're a sinner. Nobody had to teach us how to sin. And God's too holy to look on sin. And so he knew there was no way, nothing I could do to get to heaven. Nothing you could do to get to heaven. And so he did the only thing that he could do. He sent his son who knew no sin, who was perfect to walk this earth, live a sinless life, and die a criminal's death on a cross in place of me, in place of you. He took your sin's penalty and stretched his arms and was humiliated and died on a cross. But amazingly, three days later, he came back to life through the power of God to prove who he was and to prove that your sin, that death has no dominion. And to give you access to him. The Bible says that anyone 
who confesses that he is Lord, who turns from their sin, we say they repent and turns to God and calls on the name of Jesus for salvation, will be saved. Not might be saved, not you have to clean up. It doesn't matter what you've done. You will be saved. Stop trusting in yourself and relinquish control to the Lord. That's you today. If you've never done that, all you have to do is believe and say that I'm a sinner and I need Jesus for salvation. If that's you today and you've never done that, I just want to pray for you. If you want to do that today, on the count of three, just lift your hand up. No one looking around, please. One, two, three. Say, I need Jesus today. I, need, I want to be saved. Is there anybody like that? Online, you let us know. Amen. Amen. So, Father, now, as we leave here, I pray we leave on a mission to change this world. May our light shine brighter than, than when we entered in this place, God. May we be on fire. May we tell our servers, our waiters, our waitresses, our family, our co-workers, the good news, the gospel of Jesus. I love you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, church. God is good. Hey, I want to tell you this too. Yeah, let's celebrate that. I'll tell you this, and you guys are out of here. Um, we have five new deacons unanimously uh, approved, affirmed, and selected. They're going to begin serving you, the body, right away. So thank you for affirming what our leadership recognized already. I love you, church. Go out, change the world. You're sent.